You ever been at the other end of a gun? No, and I never will be. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rowley. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select, and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 103 this time, and we are now officially into May, which for us is all things noir. What dark and dangerous alleyway are you taking us down today? I picked a great one. We're going to kick off the month with The Hitchhiker from 1953, directed by Ida Lupino with Edmund O'Brien, Frank Lovejoy, and William Tallman. Two buddies pick up a murderous hitchhiker during a trip to Mexico. We know we're in good hands right away with the RKO logo, a great film noir studio. And then we have this really interesting prologue. It's a pretty poetic way of basically saying this is based on a true story. I like that even the prologue here feels different, setting us up for something less prosaic than we might be expecting. Yeah, it immediately falls in line with those grubbier, nastier noir that I love so much. Things like Detour, Edgar G. Ulmer, and those shot-on-the-fly, low-budget, poverty row noir films that are a big favorite of ours. We are introduced right away to this killer on the road, and this is a series of senseless crimes. You end up dead in a grubby lot or by the side of some godforsaken highway somewhere. Right away, I did want to mention I love the score. It's very dramatic and overblown, but in a really great way. And we get quickly, in just a matter of a few seconds, it feels like a repetition and sort of an amplification of the same scene. So it's clear that this guy means business, and you do not want to cross his path. And we don't see much except what tells us that, essentially, the details are unimportant. This hitchhiker could be any murderer. Any of us could be the victims. We see a twisted leg and a high heel. There's no life, no sense of who these people were. I disagree with that a little bit. It feels to me a little bit like the classic Ouija crime scene photos, in that if you look long enough, there's some detail that you relate to. A little piece of lace sticking out from underneath a skirt. The contents of a handbag poured out that could be completely anonymous until you see that thing that makes you think, oh yeah, I always carry this one thing myself. Interesting. Both takes on that being that this is pretty chilling, a very chilling way to start. And then we see our murderer. This is Emmett Myers. And there's a nationwide manhunt already happening. We're moving cross country from Illinois to the West and the bodies are piling up. Now, before we get into the real life underpinnings of this story, I just want to give a shout out very quickly for William Tallman here. I knew him first and foremost from Perry Mason. I think that's probably the same for everybody. Yeah, and he is absolutely wonderful here. I read about this very interesting part of his history a number of years ago. He was involved in this crazy pot party orgy. He was actually arrested, which meant that he was suspended, though eventually reinstated to Perry Mason. He maintained his innocence the whole time, too, and he was kind of vindicated. Really, it just made me like him more as a person. Yeah, a bunch of squares trying to rain on everybody's parade. No kidding. So speaking of raining on a parade, how about we talk about Billy Cook? Yeah, this one is yelling right down my alley with the true crime thing. And there's a bonus Oklahoma connection to it for me, too. We start in this prologue with the on-screen text really pushing this true story angle. And often this is just a marketing ploy. And it's definitely a little bit that here but there is more meat on these bones than usual when it comes to stuff like this. It is based on the case of William Edward Cook Jr., known as Billy, like you say, and his crime spree was a 22-day rampage that he was out there on the road, and only the last portion of that, when he picked up two hunters, is chronicled here. It does have that Oklahoma connection that I mentioned, so I was aware of the crime when I was a kid way before I was aware of the film that it even existed, The most gruesome part of his spree 
revolved around a family that he kidnapped around Tulsa and then later murdered, including their dog, the bastard. And aside from the dog, his youngest victim was three years old. Yeah, I think it was something like three, five, and seven, those yes, kids. Yes, yeah. And the way he described killing this family was basically because they were yapping. You know, I mean, he was a real callous, heartless guy, it seemed like, and they were just an inconvenience to him. And it was really the Hayes Code that forced Ida Lupino to eliminate that angle to the story and focus, as you said, on the two hunters. She didn't include that detail that Cook was known for the words hard luck tattooed on the fingers of his left hand, and though he did have a deformed right eyelid, which does feature in this story. We'll get more into that hard luck tattoo thing later when we delve into Meyer's character a little bit. But the process of this, getting it made, is really interesting. It was supposed to follow in the line of hard-hitting social realism films that Ida Lupino had been directing already, uncredited, we should say, four of them in a row, issue-oriented films. And this was supposed to pick up and play on and then further amplify that docudrama edge of those movies. She went to San Quentin. She got Cook's release to use his story. She interviewed one of those last two survivors. And then she ran up against goddamn Joseph Breen's office and the Hays Code. So they had to fictionalize this story and shift that focus away from the more gruesome elements of the killings. In a way, I think it benefits the film. It's the way that she documents the ebb and flow of O'Brien and Lovejoy's relationship that makes this movie more than just a run-of-the-mill crime picture. But I still would have loved to see what she intended to make before the more hard-boiled material got diluted. Now that we've had this buildup and have seen this carnage that's already taken place, this real danger stalking the highways, we meet the men who will fill out our story. Two men in a car, ostensibly headed to go fishing, though they don't seem too sure about it. Very briefly, we get to know these men. Small details about these old memories, the shared past that they have together. We learn that one is Gil, and Gil is played by Frank Lovejoy. It's the first time he's been away from his family. We'll soon learn that the other man is Roy. We don't know his name yet. He's excited for this trip. They're headed to Mexicali. They're going to get a drink there. But that doesn't pan out either. Now, this is the second time we're talking about Frank Lovejoy. We mentioned him in the In a Lonely Place episode. I don't know about you, but I tend to forget about him, even though he has this incredibly rich filmography. And he did a lot of suspense episodes, which is one of my very favorite radio shows. And then, of course, we have Edmund O'Brien here. Funnily enough, a very tangential suspense bit of trivia for the two people who know what I'm talking about. He was briefly married to Nancy Kelly, who also did a lot of episodes. And I didn't realize he had a very incredible theater background as well. Well, if we're talking noir pedigree, we certainly shouldn't forget Frank Lovejoy because he has a really good noir track record. He's in This, In a Lonely Place, Try and Get Me, which is excellent. I Was a Communist for the FBI, which is one of the great (laughs) titles of all time. Absolutely. I haven't seen either of those two. Try and Get Me, I think, is more up your alley, but they're both really good. And then O'Brien's noir legacy, that's the real big deal here. Just for DOA alone, he belongs in the Film Noir Hall of Fame. But along with that, There's The Killers, The Web, A Double Life, An Act of Murder, White Heat, 7-Eleven Ocean Drive, which I love, The Turning Point, which we're going to get to see on the big screen coming up at Noir City. His noir credits just go on and on, and they range from very good to some of the best ever made. This is the first time that I'm seeing men of this period who aren't in suits with their accompanying hats. It feels very different. It feels very natural. Yeah, they're just regular Joes, which makes me wonder a couple of things. And one thing I specifically wanted to ask you, we meet these protagonists. Are these good guys when it comes down to it? They've got kids, but they still feel the pull of Mexicali. Are we supposed to feel like their baser instincts led them into trouble? Like we should be mildly disapproving of their actions? We've got that... At some point, we could have just said no moment that put them here in this danger when they skip Mexicali for San Felipe. One of the DVD chapters, in fact, is titled Three Desperate Men, which puts all three of these men on equal footing with one another. So I just wonder how you feel about them as people right away. 
I mentioned that there's some uncertainty about the purpose of this trip. Is it to fish? Is it to pick up women? Is it neither of those things? Is it just to get away from their families? I think the beauty of the script here is that these are incredibly ordinary, middle-of-the-road guys. And we're going to delve more into them. We're going to get to know them more and what drives them, especially in this situation, which is the most important thing. So super relatable. No overblown heroics and nothing so macho that you can't connect to them on some sort of personal level. There is one neat telling thing, a detail in the scene that I like a lot. You notice if you're looking closely, you see Lovejoy's slightly open eye as they drive away from these indulgences, revealing that he was only feigning sleep. So it's a tip off to his character maybe when it really comes down to it. And it's a nice parallel to Talman's eye around the campfire later, later when he chides them about lying to their wives. We think back to this connection, this vision metaphor, and then we understand that they are not as far from Myers and his amorality as they might like to be. Now everyone's paths are about to intersect. Gil and Roy pick up this hitchhiker, and this is beautiful. He is in complete darkness in the back seat. We first just see his gun. And then that beautiful reveal of his face. He leans into the light. And then the three faces are lit. And right away, Emmett is in charge. This lighting is about as noir as it gets. And it really underlines how much the geography of this film is going to be the geography of the human face. Nicholas Musakara's cinematography on this thing is just outstanding and it's no surprise because he is a big time noir heavy hitter out of the past clash by night the blue gardenia the spiral staircase which looks amazing the locket by one of our favorites john brahm when you look at his track record it's clear that he knows his way around this high contrast lighting scheme Emmett here is incredibly organized making sure that he will stay in charge He's got this careful planning in place that means that when Roy and Gil have a very brief chance, when they open the trunk of the car to get to the shotgun, Myers tells them, you'll never make it, and we believe him. There's no sentimentality in this killer. He's just young and hard. You say young and hard. How old was Talman when this was made? 52? Yeah, he was 35, okay, playing because... a 28-year-old. And he looks like he's 60. I do kind of buy him a 28. I did have to look it up and then I realized, oh, well, maybe I don't buy it quite that much. This is a 28 that has been road hard and put away wet. If that's what it makes sense, though, if you're talking about William Cook's life. It's true. He was just 23 when he was executed. He looks like a kid, though, when you look at his pictures. So is that why people picked him up or was it just the time? It was a little bit of both, I would think. I'm sure he looked perfectly harmless if you were not getting a close look at that eye. But the attitudes towards hitchhiking were much different back then. I can give you a little overview of that if you like. And then I want to know if you've ever picked up a hitchhiker, or mainly your family. We certainly never did when I was a kid. We did it all the time. That was pre-1980, I would say. We traveled the Southwest a lot for my dad's summer jobs, and so we were caravanning as a family. It was usually multiple cars, so we felt pretty safe because it wasn't just us. It was my uncles in cars ahead of and behind us. We were all communicating by CB, so it probably seemed like much less of a risk to us that way. I probably would have been more afraid of you guys. <laughs> if you'd seen my uncles, probably. So how about a brief history of hitchhiking? Okay, for context, starting around World War I, cars were more affordable, becoming more affordable to the middle class. Combine that with this need for enlisted men to report for duty, to go home on leave, etc. And this is when hitchhiking really spiked for the first time in the U.S. It was how you could help the war effort. It happened one night, came along and popularized it a little bit. And then, of course, the Great Depression only exacerbated that. With World War II, it really took off, and gas rationing made carpooling and offering rides even more a patriotic thing to do. In the time that this film is set, though, that's beginning to fade a little bit, and we are just beginning to see it as more of a hallmark of the counterculture. Beatniks first, and then hippies later. So to commit a crime like this is not just the insult of preying on people's good nature, it's downright un-American. The practice continues to lose respectability with the average citizen, 
the FBI even starts an anti-hitchhiking crusade because J. Edgar Hoover now associates it with communists and socialists. Unbelievable. And then also federal highways were just beginning to be replaced by interstates as we now know them. That happened in 1956, which made it more dangerous and more difficult to hitchhike. And then it completely falls out of favor with the public at large by the 70s, the time I'm talking about when we were actually doing it. And Billy Cook's crimes took place pretty recently in relation to when the film came out. He had been executed just the year before, so that still had to be in the minds of people watching this. Yeah, I'll give you not just the cultural context of hitchhiking, but where we were in the crime world as well. This was a few years before Charles Starkweather went on his spree, and about a decade before the Clutter family was killed, that's chronicled in In Cold Blood. This time period, it comes late in the noir game, all of this post-World War existential soul-searching in those films from 1945, that's all gone by 1953, and what's left, it feels like, is the meanness and the dark as we head into the decidedly less popular Korean police action, quote-unquote, as it was euphemistically called. Now, in the movie, we are still driving, and Myers looks exhausted in the back. He's playing with this gun. He provides a way for us to get more introduced to Gil and Roy. And there's an opportunity here. There's a bump in the road. This could cause some chaos. But I think the film lets you understand how you would not be a hero, especially in that tiny moment. And so we talked about the meanness that's in this film and this time. When we look back at Billy Cook and his circumstances, his age put in the foster care system, this deformity that he had, turning to a life of petty crime pretty early on, does the age of the criminal or their circumstances, does that make a difference here? Should it make a difference here? I'm not quite sure what you're asking. Do you mean how the audience should feel about him or how these characters should react to him right now in this particular instance? Because I do have an example I wanted to point to later in terms of trying to generate sympathy with the audience. I think I'm really asking both. I'm first thinking about our characters, setting them up for, this is a guy who means business. How, what are we supposed to do here? And yeah, definitely more largely the audience. Are we supposed to feel sympathy? Well, I'll stick with the characters for right now. And I think there is one very specific characteristic that is supposed to come across that will make you wary, and that is his youth and his relative volatility because of that, how unpredictable a criminal he is. If they know his reputation, which they likely do at least a little bit after having listened to the radio some, then they know that their odds are not great. And there's a little touch here that conveys this brilliantly, I think. We see Talman register a slight amusement on his face when O'Brien says something to the effect of, when we get to the next stop, as if they have a future. We've established here that both Roy and Gil have families. Gil has kids. And we do know that their shared history involves the war. We're at least eight years away from it at this point. And I do really appreciate that even with that background, that they've got all of these things to live for and fight for, Emmett just has the upper hand. Well, you mentioned that bump in the road. And in this segment, when we're trying to determine, eh, should we make a move on this or not? He fires on an empty chamber in the gun. This landscape plays into the film in a lot of important ways, even down to creating these moments that there might be an opportunity. I mentioned earlier that the interstate highway system, it would come along three years down the road from this. And if you've ever traveled, for instance, Route 66, old Route 66, like we have, you understand a little bit just how different things were. Now add in the conditions in Baja, California to the mix, and you've got more than the occasional bump in the road. It's the desert. And it's likely going to wreak havoc on this car before too long. And we see a little bit, they pull into a station and we get a nice little bit of characterization too. Not only is he a murderer and a sociopath, but he's a racist on top of everything. Else. I know. What are you going to do? But this landscape, this is outlaw country when the camera looks around and it doesn't do that too much. She doesn't take these lingering shots. We don't get sweeping vistas the way we would in say Paris, Texas, like we just had. But we get enough to give us a definite sense of place, and we'll have two distinctly different settings. This vast, merciless desert, some of it shot in Lone Pines, California, where they made High Sierra, 
and then the claustrophobic confines of this car. Does one of these settings work better for you than the other? Do they feel nicely balanced in terms of the feeling that they generate within you? I'm with you on the balancing. And credit to Lupino here, no two shots seem to be the same. No angle in the car seems to be repeated, and it makes me think that the desert is a perfect setting for film noir. The light and the dark. There's so much contrast, and it's completely inescapable. Yeah, there is nothing as infinitely dark as the desert on a moonless night. I can't believe what they were able to create out of a budget of less than $200,000. Amazing. And speaking of scenes in the car, the character element that I like the most here is seeing Gil's arm across the seat. It's that shared passenger and driver's seat. It feels like comfort for Roy and an interesting relationship choice, too, for the time. And Roy needs that comfort because of the two men, he seems the one who is definitely more susceptible to this prodding and goading that Myers is doing to them. We discover that Santa Rosalia is the destination, and that's also part of the true story, too. That's where this story ended up. But along the way, Myers has to show off his shooting prowess, and we have this episode along the roadside that's kind of a William Tell scene, and it shows how insecure and easily goaded that Myers can be, too, because all of this comes in response to Roy saying something to the effect of, eh, we're not going to have rabbit for dinner now because you missed. So we feel how malevolently capricious he is. It's this constant threat of unpredictable violence that makes this so tense. It's like that scene in Boogie Nights with Alfred Molina and the firecrackers stretched out to 70 minutes, basically. Not content to just prove that he can shoot, he now has to make this a contest, and he makes Gil shoot at his friend Roy. He is a complete bully, basically. And Lupino's direction of the performances here, I think it homed in on just the right aspects. She highlighted everything in Talman that went right to work on my reptilian brain. If we get out of this, I am going to make you pay for what you are doing to us right now. The way she presents it, I just can't help that instinct. Wait, in that scenario, are you Gil and I'm Roy, presumably? I hope I'm the one with the gut in that case, because <laughs> I'm Grumbles, but you're Stumbles in our pair, and I do not want you taking any sort of shot at me, counting on you not falling over a cactus there in the desert somewhere. <laughs> Good point. And if I'm going to be the one that's forced to drive, you know that I'm going to edge us off to the side where they have those bumps <laughs> and wake everybody up and probably make the gun go off anyway. Speaking of the gun, there is a really nice visual touch here. You mentioned no shot is the same from scene to scene. We are looking straight down the rifle barrel as he is forcing him to do this. It is all a huge joke to Myers, not to us. And then an even bigger joke to Myers is the introduction of the police. Whenever we turn on the radio, he can listen to how close or far they are to estimating where he is, where he's going. It is kind of a joke because it is one of those noir tropes that I dearly love, but the super convenient newscast where we turn on the radio, we get exactly the information we need, we turn the radio off again. Very true. I also have a huge soft spot for the spinning newspaper. Oh yeah, in the intro I have that down here too. There's all sorts of great things in here like that. That great spinning newspaper. We have a dragnet montage here that begins... All very effective film noir and crime film tropes. We understand immediately with this visual language what is going on, how this is going to speed the process of the film along, which it's only 70 minutes to begin with, but it hurdles along like a bullet. This movie feels like it's over in 20 minutes. You know, to clarify that, though, in terms of what I'm thinking, it doesn't feel short or too short, I should say. It still feels really meaty. Yeah, you're exactly right. I don't mean it to say in any way that it's lacking or rushed, but it just zooms by. You barely can hang on, it feels like. You know, one thing that struck me during research in terms of tropes is basically the real-life trope to this production. It makes me kind of uncomfortable to even talk about it, and that is how Ida Lupino, as a director, was portrayed in the media. Yeah, I've read those accounts, and I've read a lot of stuff that she has said about her career, and it's all extremely disheartening. I am 100% with you. On the one hand, we have the fact that she was the only woman in the Directors Guild of America in the 40s and 50s. And then she talks about 
that she has people refer to her as mother during the production. I wonder how much of that she encouraged, though, and how much of it was put upon her, because her director's chair during the filming of The Hitchhiker, the back of it did not have her name. It just said, mother of us all. And then she would talk about manipulating the men that she worked with so that they would assume that the idea came from them. I'm not saying that she was alone in any of this, but like you mentioned, it's kind of disheartening. It was still 1953. She was still and forever will be a pioneer. And then there was that article, being bossed around by a lady is okay if she's Ida Lupino, and Frank Lovejoy talking about calling her doll. I do wonder, though, how much of that was made up by the publicity yeah, machine? I was just thinking the same thing. I don't even think he sat for an interview and some PR hack somewhere just scribbled that and sent it out. Or at the very least, scripted it for him to say to someone. But none of this accomplishment can be taken away from her. She stepped in to do this direction. She took control of this story. Ida Lupino's a badass. That's Absolutely. why we're doing this episode. Heck yeah. So I don't mean for that tone to somehow be disparaging. Plus, she's in one of my favorite Columbo episodes. That's true. And I love High Sierra. And you can see how much she learned from the people around her, too. Raoul Walsh, Nicholas Ray. I like that we're talking about a lot more of the production, too, and some other tangents. Because, as you mentioned, it's 70 minutes. Yeah, and technically, there are all sorts of neat things about it that might not get the proper attention sometimes. For instance, I think the day-for-night shooting on this is pretty good compared to a lot of budget pictures or even a pictures that have a much larger budget that were being made at the time it looks so sharp add to that the makeup effects too because when we have this campsite scene coming up and we get this telltale heart effect and focusing in on that eye that will not close all the way the makeup is so good that every time i forget that his eye in real life tomlin's eye is not like that and that is a true detail like you mentioned Cook did have that eyelid that would not close all the way. His eye won't close, but he's definitely getting sleepier. In this nighttime camping scene, Roy and Gill are wide awake, and Myers just continues to taunt them with their fate. Why do you think Myers, and also by extension, Billy Cook, kept these men alive at this point? If you're having to watch them overnight, you've got no rest, You've killed already multiple times. Why not just kill them and take the car and not put yourself through this endurance test? Is it just because he needs that mouse to play with? The first thing that occurred to me was that he needs someone else to drive. There's no way he could make it this distance on his own. He'd have to pull over and stop at some point, And he would probably be caught if he let his guard down for any moment. And I think that he just has the longer view here. He can see there are 500 miles to go. I have got to get there. These two dopes are the way that I'm going to do it. And there's no question what's going to happen. He tells them, you guys are going to die. That's all. It's just a question of when. I really like this scene coming up where they stop at a store. Myers continues that insistence on, you're not going to talk mechs around me. And the fact that the little girl in this story, the shopkeeper's daughter, is the one who thwarts yet another plan of Roy and Gill's. And it's yet another thing for Myers to taunt them about. Looking out for each other, caring about other people is the thing that can get you killed. One of the things that I love about this characterization, the fact that he is so blunt about their fate, it does two great things for this scene. It makes the desperation of Gil and Roy palpable. They know what they are looking down the barrel of. It's not a maybe, it's just a question of when. And also, it really nails this criminals are mostly dumb and mean and striking back at a world that they feel owes them something or is trying to put one over on them. In the scene following this, he has a little soliloquy boasting about this watch theft that he pulled off one time. And I think it's a case of he doth protest too much. He's really exposing his own insecurities. Billy Cook had those same hallmarks of that self-pitying weasel with that tattoo that you mentioned. Hard luck. Look at me. And so this is where I want to come back to that question. When William Tallman tells the story, I feel a little bit for him, maybe. I can see that bruised and broken kid that became this criminal. We see a similar thing in Robert Blake's portrayal of Perry Smith in In Cold Blood. 
there's a bit of what's inside this character. If you have any sort of empathy whatsoever, you can feel for how they got here. So in this case, or in any case, do these things generate sympathy at all? Does this complicate him enough to make him at the very least pitiable? I'm not sure about pitiable. I think you nailed it on the head with understanding where they come from. I think about those other message or issue or social pictures that Ida Lupino had done. It should make us as a society want to do better for every other kid out there who shouldn't go down that path. But I'm going to get on a big old moral high horse and just say, once you turn to illegitimate means, we're done at that point. You've had your chances. And at the same time, I want to be the person who is trying to give more chances before it gets that far. But really, having said that, I feel like one of the least interesting people on Donahue. (laughs) Well, I feel like in terms of having gotten this far, where I ultimately come down is no matter how charming the portrayal or the real life criminal, I always come back to the fact that loads of people have had a rough time of it in their lives, but that does not make them feel entitled to destroy others. Roy, again, he's been forced to do all the driving here, is just getting more and more tired getting pushed closer to the edge every moment. And I'm wondering, is it going to make him give up or do something stupid? Well, it's already been set up that there is a slight divide between each of these men in that regard. And I think it's Myers trying to drive a wedge between the two of them in the first place. He assesses the fact that because Gil is a draftsman, he is the smart one. Turns out that that's probably true. He's the one that's saying, don't make your play too early. But there is definitely a class element in play here as well, with O'Brien, with Roy being the man in the middle. You've got Myers as the criminal lowlife, Roy is the blue-collar mechanic, and then Gill is the white-collar draftsman. And I keep coming back to this question, depending on where they are positioned on this triangle, who has more in common? Because Roy's breakdown later is much more in keeping with Myers' emotional instability than Gill's level-headedness. Do you think that it stirs any resentment between the two of them when he initially says that? Do you feel like he is successful in separating them a little bit that way? I would have to watch it again and see what the actors are telling me, but I didn't think so. I feel like they are in it together, keeping each other going, which makes me think about that war buddy angle. And when Myers is questioning why they came to Mexico and they don't really correct him about any of his assumptions... I'm thinking about the time period. I'm thinking about these masculine roles and what the movie is telling us or these really interesting questions it's making us ask. No one really addresses it, but I think there's also a lot of interesting subliminal sexual stuff going on here too, or at least the possibility for that analysis. I don't think it was necessarily intentional or specifically coded, but in that moment that you talk about when he mocks them over their ruse about getting away from their family and lying to their wives, he derisively suggests that maybe all of this was to chase dames as if that's disposable or even unappealing. Later on the road, Gil abandons his wedding ring as a clue to be followed. He might have chosen something else, but instead he's ditching this really potent symbol of heteronormative behavior. Someone could probably have a field day, a really good go at analyzing this on those terms, starting with Tomlin's constantly waving his gun around, that's how he's introduced, all the way down to his leather daddy coat that he forces O'Brien to wear later. I'm exaggerating some of this for comic effect, obviously, but there is no mistaking that this film is much more about male relationship dynamics and, to a lesser degree, domination and submission than it is about committing any crime. It's not quite the gun show off in Red River, but definitely (laughs) there's some things to talk about. Roy and Gil are definitely still taking some chances here, trying to possibly disable the radio, get more chances to pull over, like with flat tires, putting a hole in the crankcase, leaving clues of themselves. But for the moment, no one is coming to their rescue. And now we get more introduced to what the police are actually doing anticipating where they're heading, tracking reports of people who notice them. And a bit later, they're going to have actual false broadcasts to try to throw Myers off. I like a little thing that Tallman does here when it comes to the horn getting stuck, this ruse that they are pulling over to try to disable the radio with. 
it's our first glimpse, I feel like, of how truly pathetic he is when something is even slightly out of his control. But the authorities are really on top of things here. They're putting these pieces together. And meanwhile, they are really running this car ragged. They may not have to pull a ruse because it is falling apart. One detail I really love about the breathless news reporting of this section is the strange race against death. I thought that was a really great piece of screenwriting. Yeah, that's perfect. And it's interesting that the presentation of police here is that they're smart, cooperating. There's no bungling happening. And really, by the 1950s, police professionalism was being touted as a way to improve police effectiveness and reform policing in general. There was a book in 1943, Police Administration, which became kind of a blueprint for professional policing. There was also an emphasis on military-style organization and discipline. So this definitely feels of its time. Well, this is all on a collision course for everyone to meet in Santa Rosalia. We've seen now that without his gun, he is no tough guy. He's a punk. He shoots the dog. And in their wake, you're absolutely right. The authorities are, conveniently or not, making the right play at every juncture. It really is interesting to me that this film shows a great deal more respect for law and order than I am used to, even the Mexican police, which I wouldn't have been surprised at them being portrayed disrespectfully considering the time that this film was made. It was not the most enlightened time, obviously, compared to now. But there are no implications of incompetence or even corruption on either side of the border. We mentioned that she was up against the Hayes Code, though. Do you think that this is a byproduct of that, maybe? That there's no glorifying outlaws and making law enforcement look like stooges in comparison? I feel less like that and point back to the real story, which involves a very prosaic, a word I used earlier, resolution to Billy Cook's crime. A Mexican police chief basically walked up to Cook, took the revolver from his belt, and arrested him. One other thing I really like about this section with the Mexican police, no subtitles, although I don't think that was an artistic choice necessarily. More of a financial thing? Yeah, but it works out to really give us a better feeling for what's happening and separate the two processes on either side of the border. We're moving closer and closer and closer to this breaking point. Roy decides to try to make a move while they've stopped to sleep. He's going to make a break for it on foot, but he can't physically do it. And it's Gil helping him up rather than running away alone, which means that their escape attempt is foiled. This scene is truly terrifying. When those headlights come on and they realize they are caught, that to me is better than any 10 jump scares that we've seen put together recently. I have seen this film multiple times And it still makes the hair on my arm stand up when those headlights come on every time. You know what got me this time? When they're stopped again a bit later, when they're finally having to ditch the car, and there's that deep well, I think about the very real possibility that if they were killed there, they might never be found. When they pull over and they are looking down that mine shaft, that is similar to a detail that's pulled straight from the true crime itself. That family that I mentioned that picked up Cook in Oklahoma, they all ended up at the bottom of a mine shaft in Missouri. So anyone that was familiar with the newspaper accounts tied this image on screen to a very grim ending that they were fully aware of. But you're right, we're at the breaking point. He's toying with them and they can't take it anymore. Or at least Roy can't. It's infuriating. It is even to me as a viewer. We have yet another conveniently timed newscast and we discover the car is shot. They are going no farther except on foot. And again, they are in the desert. And Roy's injured at this point. There are search vehicles out for them. And they're so close, but so far away. And Roy finally just collapses at this point. We mentioned that we like all the tropes that mark this as film noir, but it's when we get into the desert, conveniently enough, that this film really separates itself from its contemporaries. We no longer have a noirish background, and Roy is completely broken. As we move away from the traditional noir tropes, we discover what is original and really compelling about this treatment of this story. It's this desperation and degradation of him shouting completely impotently at this search airplane where we have found the true darkness in this story. And it's still going to get worse. Myers has a final plan as they've at last arrived at Santa Rosalia. 
He's going to make Roy change clothes with him. In case they're caught, maybe the cops will think Roy is Myers and kill him. I do like that it's his ignorance that, yes, makes him the bully, makes him the one in charge, but is going to end up with his downfall. This fairy that he's been counting on catching in Santa Rosalia has burned up. There's got to be this plan B. He still needs them for a bit longer. They're going to hire another boat, and while they wait for that, Myers taunts them again, caring for each other, because it slowed them down. It has kept them here. And O'Brien here makes the subtext text finally and says out loud, without that gun, you're nothing. It's what we've been thinking this whole time, and he finally puts the words to it. And it turns out it's true. Without his gun, he is nothing. He's just a sniveling wretch, and we see that writ large here in this final shootout, would you call it? This final confrontation. Shootout at the docks. Pretty noirish. You know, and as the firing starts, it isn't with the gun that Myers goes out. It's with a whimper. He's disarmed, and he finally looks terrified, and it's putting the cuffs on him that makes him convulse. And do you think we had to have that part about Roy getting those punches in? Oh my God, yes. I was waiting for that for the last half an hour. I think it's absolutely necessary for this to end satisfactorily. Our last moment truly is of friendship and comfort. It's Gil saying, it's all right now, Roy. It's all right. As he walks away with him, comforting him, practically carrying him. Yeah, it really underlines what we've been saying about how it's the male friendship that sets this apart from all of its contemporaries. It's a very masculine movie in general. Army buddies on a fishing slash hunting trip away from their family. The only female character of note is that little girl they interact with in the store for just a few seconds. We talked about how Lupino handled all of this behind the scenes and how sensitively she had to approach these men to get the results that she wanted. It makes me wonder... Is this setup of army buddies really the only acceptable form of male intimacy at the time that this was made? Because it made me think of something like the best years of our lives and that we can only show affection and tenderness between men if they've gone through something together as harrowing as war. I like that we're not left, at least to me, thinking that these are necessarily heroes. They show fear. This is all about survival. And they are still saved. It's not like they take the guns and kill him and save the day. They are saved. Do you feel like it's anticlimactic in that regard? Because I've read some criticism. You mentioned a little bit of it. Did it need a different ending? You know what? The more I think about it, and the more I think about what we talked about earlier with Ida Lupino's messages to the press about her process, it kind of seems like a middle finger that no, these guys are not going to save the day. They do get saved. These are ordinary people, and this is how it would go down. And maybe she just said those things to shut people up, these questions that she was constantly being asked, that her collaborators were being asked. What's it like to work with a woman? What's it like being directed by a woman? I agree. I think it works right in line with everything else that she's established up to now. No big macho energy bullshit deus ex machina comes in. And on top of that, it really is just the true story. It was an unremarkable ending to a heinous chain of events. That's just not what people are looking for, I guess. So kudos to her for resisting what I am sure had to be a lot of pressure to change that to a more dramatic ending. And would you agree then the biggest kudos go to this character that Lupino shaped and that William Tallman just took off running with? Yeah, aside from Lupino, Tallman is the real MVP here. He just knocks this out of the park. Digging into it without overplaying it, he is really a creep for the ages. In the pantheon of all-time film noir creeps, he goes right up there with Van Heflin in The Prowler for me on that Mount Rushmore. So did we adequately cover why you chose it? I know that we really love these 70-minute, two-fisted, B-slot on the schedule film noir, We do love these shorter films. Is it because we couldn't take the suspense for longer than 71 minutes? I don't think I could. It's all of the things that we've talked about, everything that went into creating this story, and Ida Lupino being the force for all of that. Taking elements from Robert Joseph's story, The Persuader, and a section of 
Build My Gallows High by Daniel Mannering, who was a blacklisted author at the time. Spoiler alert, I'm going to mention him later. I just love these because I like things that don't waste my time. Now, make no mistake, I do love my contemplative, gauzy, slow cinema. But for a story like this, it should be as economical and brutal as the crimes themselves. The production of it sure worked that way. It was a five-week production schedule, and that budget you mentioned just south of $200,000. They didn't have time to waste either, and it should move like a bullet like this. And it absolutely does that. Subplots? Never heard of them. It's relentless, and when you look at The Hitchhiker, you know that Ida Lupino could go toe-to-toe with Edgar Ulmer or Don Siegel. You don't end up with your work included in the National Film Registry by accident. It would really be nice to see this get the detour treatment and get cleaned up a little bit and reach a broader audience than I think it has. Because it's still in the public domain. Yeah, and it's just as valuable to the noir canon as those other films, definitely. It's every bit as compelling a piece of filmmaking for sure. The other aspect of this, obviously, is something that's near and dear to our hearts that we talk about frequently, especially when it comes to genre filmmaking. Watching this process of female filmmakers making their bones in these genre pictures first, and then moving on to something bigger like Patty Jenkins, for instance. We see it working the same way. We see it improving, hopefully, lately. I still have to say, though, as much as I hate to say it, we see these filmmakers having to adopt maybe a modified version of Lupino's strategy for survival. This not coming across as threatening and maintaining what she described as their feminine traits, quote unquote. It's easy for us to say now what we might have done were we in her shoes in hindsight, but I don't know that there was any smarter, more efficient path for Ida Lupino in her circumstances to take, considering what she wanted to get done in the sexual politics of the time. There's a part of me that wants her to raise more hell, but then does she get branded as difficult and never works again, and then we don't get this incredible film? It's a big question. I alluded to the blacklist that easily could have happened to her if the wrong person decides that they want to end her career. But let's set that aside for the moment because we can't truly ever answer it. Final question for this movie. Was The Hitchhiker the first noir directed by a woman. Now, this is probably the case for the U.S., but other countries have seen earlier noirs, and there's a really interesting example that I would love to see, and that's Death is a Caress from 1949, directed by Edith Karlmar. Well, lucky for you, not two hours ago, thanks to the old gray market, there's a copy on the way to our mailbox as we speak, because I have been reading about this thing for years, and I've wanted to see it. And in doing my research, prepping for this episode, I finally decided, okay, I'm just going to find one, whatever it takes, and we are going to watch this film. So we'll have one within the week. And it might end up as a recommendation at some point. Hey, speaking of, how about your recommendation? I am recommending this time The Devil Thumbs a Ride from 1947, directed by a favorite of ours, Felix Feist, and starring Lawrence Tierney and Ted North. I chose it for a couple of reasons. First, one of the newscasters in The Hitchhiker actually says the phrase in one of these news reports, and second, it is another wonderful example of that brutal, to-the-point style of B-noir that we love so much. It clocks in at a whopping 62 minutes long which is just enough time for Lawrence Tierney to scare the bejesus out of everybody as this lantern-jawed lunatic who hitches a ride after committing a murder of a theater manager, a cinema manager, so it's near and dear to our hearts. How dare he do that? And then he starts bumping off the other passengers after being stymied by a roadblock and simply because he doesn't really have anything better to do. I assuming he didn't know he was being filmed. Classic Lawrence Tierney, right? (laughs) He is deranged. And you can't take your eyes off of him. Another one of those really charming sociopaths. Nor should you take your eyes off of him, ever. He's a different type of maniac than Tallman's rendition of Emmett Myers here, too. He is more the prototype of that charming monster that we would come to know in the 70s as the Ted Bundys of the world. He just happens to be in a fedora this time. What about you? I chose a film with a direct connection to this one, and that is Out of the Past from 1947, directed by Jacques Tourneur, with Robert Mitchum, Jane Greer, and Kirk 
Douglas. <laughs> now, this also gives me a chance to mention Eddie Muller's Dark City Dames, which I will never leave the opportunity to do that behind. Jane Greer is featured in that book. And it's connected to The Hitchhiker through the novel and the screenplay by Daniel Mannering. He adapted his own novel, Build by Gallows High, into this film. Ida Lupino took part of that novel and part of Robert Joseph's story to make The Hitchhiker. It's about a private eye whose past catches up with him. And I love just reading about the film as well, especially what great friends Robert Mitchum and Jane Greer were. And there's a scene that came about purely by accident. They were being filmed without their knowledge as they just sat and talked companionably. It's just great and very sad, which you know I'm always going to go for. Mm -hmm. So once again, that's two great recommendations. The Devil Thumbs a Ride and Out of the Past. And that brings us to the end of episode 103. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes. So you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. There are over 20 hours of material now over there waiting for you. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. I wanted to mention this time that our new podcast network, the 25th Frame, does more than just podcasts. And I wanted to talk this time about another of our offerings, the videos of our dear friend Daisuke Beppu. Daisuke Beppu, you mean that prince among us mortal, regular human <laughs> he beings? He is a legend, and he has a YouTube channel that's virtually overflowing with his thoughtful and humane ruminations on all sorts of cinematic subjects. He talks a lot about Criterion-related stuff, so if you're a collector of those titles, you will appreciate that. He did a great series on the films of Edward Yang. He did an incredible 13-episode breakdown of Criterion's Ingmar Bergman box set. He answers listener-submitted questions, and he really is just the most delightful and genial host. All these preconceived ideas that you have about YouTubers, hey, what's up, everybody, smash that like button, all that garbage, forget that. That does not happen here. That is right out. It is a soothing oasis of calm and welcoming analysis and discussion. You will love it, I promise. So check out Dice Case channel on YouTube or at 25thframemedia.com. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Josh Hornbeck, Marcus Penn, the fine gentleman of Fuds on Film, Andy Wolverton, Terry and Liz at Happily Cinemarried, and David Harrington. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure and tag us so we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, and the 25th Frame. Just about anywhere you get your podcast, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. Fifth Frame, a listener-supported network celebrating film and culture worldwide.